Hello and welcome to the Coffee and Comics Club. I'm Todd A. I'm Taylor Trask. Welcome, Taylor. This is our first uh, reunion show in a while. <laughs> post post San Diego Comic Con. For well, which you were. Did... Wait, did we do? Oh, we did a preview. Sorry, sorry. We sorry. did. Yeah, we yeah, did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're doing a um, uh, a, a wrap up of all things SDCC, not just what I saw, but uh, a bunch of other stuff too. A lot of good things came out, and I figured, you know, before we get back into books again, it was a great time to stop. It, it, it's kind of, we haven't done a potluck episode for a while where we just sort of talk about all the, the things on the geek horizon. So this will be a good time to catch up uh, on a lot of stuff. It's interesting, though, because, you know, a lot of things are either on hi- hiatus or if you're Marvel, you we have to wait until next year, apparently. So I, it's, I know. you know. Speaking of that, I heard Saga is on hiatus for the next year. Yes. So let's start with that. The the graphic novel or the comic series Saga, which you're a huge fan of. I'm yep. still I still have to get into it. Mike, if you go back to the Mike Marlowe episode of uh of our show, um, he talks about it uh very eloquently. Yes. And I'd I'd love to hear uh get him back in the studio again too. But yeah, saga's taking a whole year off. Um are you caught up on saga? I think I am. Um, is that are they leaving it in a place where that's going to be okay? Like, can I, I mean, or is it like going to be an awkward cliffhanger to go no, off? As, on? as I recall, um, and maybe Mike had said a little bit of this too, right? Or right, I know right before you talked to Mike, um, uh, I think I had maybe reviewed, I don't remember. I'm, I'm looking back through our episodes now. Did I review a standalone saga? You but, have, um, yeah, you did. The uh, it um, for sure. At some point in the saga series, it would they started sort of doing side quests to the mm-hmm. main story. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think it's comfortable taking off in another direction right now. Okay, uh, and yeah, I yeah. mean they they the way they describe it, they need the break to stay creatively I, engaged. I mean, I can't blame anybody for that. They, they've their quality uh, and output has been very high for a long time. So yeah, and if you're looking for that Mike Marlowe episode, it is number sixty nine. Nice. Number 69. That's that's appropriate. I don't um, know if he would he would agree, but yeah. Uh, so we're uh you know, a little BTS here. We're recording this afternoon evening, late afternoon. Um I are you drinking a coffee today? I right am now? on the way back to the office today. I stopped by Starbucks because I've <laughs> for some reason have after being in Italy amongst good coffee, and you know, we've got good coffee in Colorado Springs, as I've talked about many times. I just I I have I'm sort of in a workmanlike mode again, and I think like the you know, the coffee of the working man is Starbucks, apparently. So I, <laughs> I have a uh, I have a t- I have a, a tall pike place and a grande cup with a lot of cream, and I'm Drinking well, that's that funny now. because um, I've been drinking Starbucks all day uh, because when you got one of those little gold cards, it's free refills. <laughs> oh, I did not um, know this. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the reason to maintain your gold status as far as I'm concerned. So if I just want to camp out in the Starbucks and do a lot of work or camp out in a, a coffee shop, you know, spend three bucks on one coffee and, and refill it. Uh, but right now I'm not drinking coffee because I've, I've had a lot today. But I've got this new... Um, I, I don't know that it surpasses uh, my ginger beer um, love, but it is definitely like an intriguing competitor, which is uh, the, there, there's a market out here called Sprouts. Do you have Sprouts there? I don't know if this oh, is yeah. like. Oh, yeah. Okay. So love Sprouts, Sprouts, they have their own brand of uh, probiotic soda the, uh, called Live Soda. And so they have like a Dr. Pepper blend of this and a cola one and a root beer and a ginger beer and a lemon lime. And I'm drinking one of the lemon limes right now. It has zero calories, zero fat, zero sodium, zero sugar. (laughs) Actually, uh, look up my bad. No. Yeah. Yeah. Zero sugars, but five grams of some other stuff. Erythritol. (laughs) Great. (laughs) Tail from that. But anyway, it's uh, just kind of like a, um, you know, it, this is like, I, I can't drink a soda soda anymore it's like mm. i finally reached that age where that is so much you know high fructose corn syrup that it just yeah. overwhelms my body so that's a good yeah. move that's a healthy yeah. move i mean i well, guess i'm getting plenty of that in my starbucks coffee anyway so yeah, there you go <laughs> well let's talk about san diego comic-con i want to break Absolutely. this up into three sections the good the bad and the ugly Okay. And uh, if you if you know anything about this year's SDCC, you can probably guess where certain things are going to go. But let's start with the good, because a lot of good came out of Comic-Con this year. And a lot of it was for DC. 
um, the DC Cinematic Universe specifically had some really interesting stuff. Um, the Shazam trailer and the Aquaman trailer, let's start with those two. It was kind of cool to finally see Shazam has been shooting for a while. I think they wrapped recently, and yet we hadn't really seen a lot. A couple uh, unofficial images uh, snapped on set, and then one or two official images. And then I think there was like a, a promotional uh, a display for a theater that somebody snapped a picture of too, but nothing in, in the way of a trailer until SDCC. And yeah. it came out, Zachary Levi, you know, of Chuck fame is, is, Shaz- is the older version of Shazam. And then Billy Batson, I forget his actor's name. Mark I Strong is in it as Savina, uh, which is cool. But the whole thing, it was shocking because after years of grim, dark DC trailers, here was this lovely little, almost kind of like cheesy sort of yeah. you know, 90s looking just little comedy movie that happens to have Shazam as the main guy. And I was, it was really refreshing to see. Have you, have you checked it out yet? Yes, I did. So I had not uh, watched it like right after Comic-Con. I only watched it this weekend after you and I talked uh, and just caught up yesterday. And I was, I was shocked at that. I'd kind of stayed away from it because I thought, Oh, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm not like super in love with this character, but I just, I just saw it like a plastic man movie or something like, I don't want this. Yeah. So I was really enthusiastic about it. Like they have, I, I didn't know about that actor. You know, I was just, I, cause I pictured that guy from Chuck going into a, the dark DCEU. Yeah. And I just yeah. didn't want to see that. And it turns out like, no, it's funny and he's charming and it's, it's a cool, like kids kind of story. And it, like, I think the camaraderie between, um, you know, Billy or Shazam and his, uh, he'll always be Captain Marvel to me, by the way. Uh, but, um, <laughs> that's pretty like Marvel the, uh, lawsuit. <laughs> the, um, he was, uh, the, the camaraderie between the two kids was so much like the Spider-Man homecoming camaraderie. Yeah. You know? yeah. And so I just really loved that. And, and that actor, the Chuck actor is such a perfect dude to pull that off you know oh completely and they put him in they did the thing where they put him in like the muscle suit you know it's all yeah. his like fake muscle because I, I was like man how hard is that guy gonna have to work out the answer is not much at all because they just put him in like a suit that has the muscles but it works it strangely works well like, and that's yeah and that's kind of what the cartoon or the, like the comic book shazam looks like oh, he i was shocked like- yeah. I was shocked by how loyal, like I thought they were gonna mess with the costume. The costume looks yeah. pretty damn accurate, like yeah. more so than I ever thought they would they would go. I'm gonna make a bold prediction. I think this to the is is gonna be to DCCU what Guardians of the Galaxy was to Marvel. Oh, it's I gonna be a like whole new gear man or or Spider-Man Homecoming, but I like this Guardians uh because, and the reason I say that is because prior to Guardians coming out. Marvel didn't really have that like totally different lens of a movie. Like, you know, Thor was its thing and then they all kind of fit together. Like guardians was this weird new thing that it, it's hard to remember now, but I distinctly recall seeing and reading a lot of concern prior to guardians come out. Like, Oh, no one's going to know what this is. This yeah. is going to be Marvel's first flop. Like, believe it or not, those articles were written in bulk And then it came out and totally just everybody was like, holy crap, this is so much fun. Nobody saw this coming. This is like, this is the new direction for Marvel. I kind of think that's what this is going to be for the DCCU. And honestly, Um, they could roll it into like, you know, uh, bringing in the Marvel family and having Mary Marvel and uh, whatever his name was, Captain Marvel Jr. And um, and then they have like an old uncle that has like a Marvel. Oh, yeah. 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 Powers, too. Yeah. yeah, and there's a whole uh, like Black Adam family too. I well, think, and let, so. I'm glad you said that. Let's not forget that Dwayne the Rock Johnson has been for years now <laughs> attached to being Black Adam, um, and he's never said we're not doing that anymore. I think he's still, I think he's still down as long as they're going to make it. So he may even cameo in this first film. Uh, my guess is that there's like a stinger credit at the end. He's gonna he's gonna show up somehow. Um, mm. So you get you get. I mean, the Dwayne Johnson is doing like everything he's in is like super fun. Like Jum- who would have thought Jumanji two would be anything like would be basically like last year's most interesting, fun movie. And it kind of was, it was like, I loved it way more than I ever thought I would. I think he's, I think him as black Adam is, is going to be the, the secret sauce to all this. Like Zachary Levi is going to tee it up. And if they can, if they can have a successful uh, theatrical run, I think you're going to see like, you know, Dwayne, they're gonna they're gonna speed release that second one. With Dwayne Johnson is Black Adam. 
I'm yeah. excited. And Mark and Strong, my boy, he's in it as Savannah. So I, Savannah. And I, yeah, I don't have any. Um, uh, I don't have a lot of deep knowledge of Shazam because the Shazam character came from that like other comic line that DC acquired, I guess. So it was oh, always yeah. weird to see him in the DC universe. Um, uh, I think that plays to their advantage, though. I, I, think, I think it does movie-wise, for yeah. sure. I mean, yeah. can you imagine a team-up between him and Wonder Woman? Like oh, that? Man. that is your Captain America and um, uh, uh, Star-Lord kind of like pairing yeah. right there, you know? Yeah. Like, um, but it would... Uh, Anyway, I, my only recommendation is like if you're if you want to read a cool Shazam comic, um, Jeff Smith did this one called Shazam and the Monster Society of Evil. That's like 10 years old at this point, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but Jeff Smith did this uh, this comic called Bone for a long time. And just the art and the story of Monster Society of Evil is so fun and like childlike. But uh, you, you like it's perfectly appropriate to read it with a kid. But I think it's also like adults will like just sort of the the feeling of like, this is like good old fashioned 1950s superhero comic, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's just a lot of fun. So I highly recommend that comic. Nice. That's nice. all I know about Shazam. <laughs> well, on the other side, uh, you know, like this was, this was DC going, look, we can be fun. We can be like Guardians <laughs> of the galaxy. Here we go. And it, and not in a cheap shitty way. Like this was really great on the other side. DC is going, Oh, but we can also be like game of Thrones. And here's the Aquaman trailer. And they released <laughs> this like, just crazy, epic, beautiful looking trailer that like, I'm actually on board to see Aquaman now. Like, and I was really like thinking, I mean, that's coming out in December and we haven't really seen much yet. And so see, it's, you know, they were kind of saving this it. Apparently. Trailer excite you. Like you want to see it now. It didn't excite me. Like, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of other trailers where you're like, I can't wait to see this. Like I'm, I'm more interested in seeing Shazam than Aquaman, but I'm definitely going to show up to the, I was thinking about just renting Aquaman at this juncture, but I might go to the theater now. Cause it looks, it looks like something that needs to be seen on a bigger screen. I think they're going to really lean into the, the grand grandeur of it. I will have, I have one comment though. If they can find some way kind of offhandedly to have, aquaman say something because he's riding a giant seahorse dragon essentially um if they can have him <laughs> say something along the lines of dracarys or some word that where it's like a little nod <laughs> to game of thrones my life will be complete then i'll be like oh they get it like james wan will be my new favorite person they, well some little some little nod you know i i really wouldn't put it past them dropping in a, a other um movie references because if you missed it there is a reference to Hunt for Red October in that trailer when he drops through the submarine and he says permission to come aboard. That's exactly what Alec Baldwin says. Oh, nice. Scott Glenn in uh, Hunt for Red October. Oh, fantastic. Um, but uh, I was excited to see uh, Black Manta, who's that yeah. uh, super villain. The huh. only thing on like watching the trailer for like the third time that kind of concerned me was there's this big... Uh, like the the sort of the plot that they tease in the trailer is about um, Arthur having to return to Atlantis to, you know, defend the kingdom from his brother, who's, I guess, sort of the Cersei of the kingdom, you know, who's mm -hmm. trying to take it over. And I thought, oh, no, are we going to see is this going to be one of those things where, like, there's three acts of the movie that are about that. And then there's this mm -hmm. weird tacked on supervillain Black Manta plot that comes out later. Or, you know, like, sort of like um, when I watched Suicide Squad, I kept waiting for the, like, the second half of it to be about Joker. Mm, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or or is it going to be like Joker, where Black Manta's just in it, and it's n and that doesn't actually pull away from the the actual plot of the movie. I'm, I'm just I, curious about that, and I it just kind of gave me the, that's the only thing I was, like, had reservations about. But I'll definitely see it in the theater. My wager is that it it will be like Hawkeye in the first Thor movie where it's like, oh, there's Hawkeye. And oh, then like, yeah. he'll have a thing and that will be it. And you're like, ooh, we'll see him again in the next movie. But it won't be, you know, it won't be this like, at least I would hope. Because it's, I think, surely they've learned their lesson in From terms like of like Batman versus Superman. Oh, right? like, man. That's, like, that's probably the better comparison. It's like, yeah, you're right. Yeah. You know, they could have, I mean, not your Hawkeye comparison is good. I mean, that's a better comparison than the one I made, which is like <laughs> about a suicide squad. I think. I don't think anybody's interested in repeating super suicide squad no. at this point like that. I, I actually yeah. rewatched yeah. some of it the other day thinking like, has it aged? Well, it's aged so terribly. Like, and it's only I been like, two years. It's just so bad. Oh, it's so bad. Even on, is even as an airplane movie, which is where, I mean, I watched, it was on the, uh, the docket on the way back from Italy. And I'm like, well, let me, let me just 
fast forward through a few scenes and see and it's like oh god no it's just all of it all of it's just just so poorly conceived i mean it's like the worst use of will smith ever it's <laughs> you know like the joker should have been the main villain um i you know real quick did you ever see that uh dc animated universe movie that they did about the suicide squad uh three years ago dc animated suicide it oh i came know what out. you're talking about yeah 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 and I, I did not see it but i know what you're talking about uh, oh batman assault on arkham that's what it's officially called yeah and it's like batman's barely in it but it's about the suicide squad and holy crap it is the it is what they should have just ripped off completely because it's perfect and the joker's in it but the joker's like he's kind of behind glass like hannibal lecter style so he's not like they can interact with him but he's not a pivotal part of the whole thing um and it's it's it it's like they saw that and went well we're just gonna make a crappier version of it like it just, yeah. anywho mm. anywho i i am interested in aquaman when i wasn't before and and hopefully they are you know, setting it because like Jason Momoa was really fun in, in Suicide Squad. So hopefully it's or, uh, it, Justice League. Or Justice League. God, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, no, he, he really was like that. He was one of the, the standouts in that. Honestly, Justice League would have been amazing if you just got rid of Batman and Superman. You're so right. Because the Flash the villain, was great. I guess. Uh, even Cyborg was OK, too. Like he wasn't, um, you I, know, he didn't have a I lot to do. No, I, I Right. I agree. I wish his costume was a little bit better. It seems like only at the end did they give him his proper, like, you know, breastplates and everything. And it's like, well, yeah. th just start with that. Don't, oh, but, um, anywho, we can't, so we can't I, go off on justice league right now. <laughs> no, we can't. One thing, the other thing. Okay. So you would ask, are you excited to see this Aquaman yeah. movie after this trailer? And the answer is yeah. What I'm excited to see is the glass movie because that trailer came out as well. It's if you aren't paying attention, Glass is the direct sequel to Unbreakable, but also the sequel to Split, which came out two years ago, that James McAvee movie, um, all M. Night Shyamalan. But it's the first time M. Night Shyamalan's like, hey, these are all connected. And so Glass will focus on all those characters. But I think Samuel Jackson's Mr. Glass is kind of the main fulcrum of the whole thing. Uh, yeah, but that trailer I, just looked badass. I was like, please, I, I want to see this now. It does look cool. It's weird to me that they recast the Beast as James McAvoy. I thought he was just <laughs> Professor X, but <laughs> it, it, anyway, there's a strange Fair moment enough. in it where somebody says, like, I want to see the Beast, and then they show James McAvoy, like, leaping across the ground, much like the Beast from the X-Men. Somebody needs to do a super cut where, like, uh, Samuel Jackson says that, and then, like, Kelsey Grammer as the Beast, like, his face ah! opens in. <laughs> well, hello. And it's like, you know. <laughs> And then, like, you hear, like, the, the Frasier theme song start playing. Like, that would be a really – I'm sure someone's done it. I should look and see it. But this – I mean, visually, it looks amazing. And yep. I'm not, like – I'm highly critical of M. Night Shyamalan. He has squandered a lot of goodwill. And so it – I actually was reading an interview on io9. They did, and he actually it's, – it's, it was really refreshing because he actually uh, acknowledged a lot of that. He's like, look, I have figured out that my sweet spot are these sort of, like, puzzle box kind of thrillers. And if, if I stick to that, like unbreakable seems to be the one thing that everybody universally still likes. And if I stay in that world, I'll be fine. And so it's kind of like, well, that was refreshing. And then it just looks great. Um, and it looks like it, it looks like one of those superhero movies that we need right now where it's not, you know, it's about superheroes, but it's not really, it's more about like, you know, this, it's kind of like one flew over the cuckoo's nest that just happens to have, yeah. you know, comics aesthetics with it, which well, I love. Now I had not seen I have not seen Unbreakable or Split or any M Night Shyamalan movies. You haven't seen Unbreakable? Six Cents, probably. I don't think I've ever seen another M Night Shyamalan. You never movie. watched Unbreakable? No. I, I've. Oh my god. So it really, but I did get. I was actually surprised when they when the uh, the Sarah Paulson character said something about uh, superheroes in the movie because I didn't know that that was sort of explicit that they that that's what they thought they were. You know, in mm. like in the in the glass trailer. Um, mm -hmm. I, I thought it was much more like that. What was that? Will Smith, Jason Bateman, Charlize Theron movie where they were like, superheroes. Oh yeah, yeah, Will yeah, Smith. yeah. That, but yeah. it was, I thought it was that kind of world of like, we're okay. not living in it. So, but I, but I appreciated that twist Hancock. of like Hancock. Yeah. Yeah. Where it's sort of that, you know, these three people are in a mental institution because they, she, the Sarah Paulson's character is dealing with like this delusion that they think they are superheroes. And I, right before you and I started recording, I had said, oh yeah, I wanted to mention uh, that that other young woman who's in it, um, Anya Taylor-Joy, because I had just seen her in Thoroughbreds last year, oh. which was super creepy, mm -hmm. which I, I definitely like, if you want to see like a really creepy movie, 
uh, where she does like, like she and, and the other like um, co-lead are terrifying in it. Um, but uh, you, you then told me that she was in Split, which I hadn't realized because I hadn't seen Split. But also when I uh, looked her up on IMDb, she's also in the New Mutants. She's magic. She's a Whoa. Colossus's sister um iliana rasputin so um, interesting yeah i'm that like kind of i was like oh shit now i'm back on board for the new mutants like <laughs> having really liked her in thoroughbreds like well pretty cool you have some homework between now and the next episode you need to go watch unbreakable um just that I mean, one i mean did you think split was good as well Split was good too but it's it you you don't find out it's connected to unbreakable until like the last 30 seconds oh so okay okay it, it's its own thing and then at the very end bruce willis shows spoilers bruce willis shows up and like he's like uh, he's, you know he comments and that was that was such a mind uh mind fuck for everybody in the theater because it's like holy crap it's connected because everybody's always like i said everybody's always looked back on unbreakable it, Strangely, that was the first thing he did after Sixth Sense. I think a lot of people forget that too. Um, that you know, it came out right. the, the next year, but a lot of people look back at Unbreakable with a lot of reverence as time has gone. It's aged fairly well. It's it's actually it does that thing that you and I like, where it tells a really subtle, quiet story very, very well. Um, Samuel Jackson and Bruce Willis's characters are 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 kind of two halves of the same whole, and it's really really compelling. Yeah. It really it does that really wonderful thing to the comics medium that I love. You know what I look for in image titles like this. This would make a really good indie graphic novel. Um, so it's that kind of movie, and I can't wait for it to come out. It just visually, it looks like it looks amazing. But I Samuel Jackson's character in this is really great, um, and like the genesis of his character and why he thinks the way he does is really cool. And you can tell when Unbreakable finishes, like there's so much more story to tell. And I feel like Glass is gonna hopefully pick that up. Ooh. Anyway, um, my favorite part of of SDCC clearly was the Doctor Who panel and trailer. We finally, after a really cool but brief teaser, we get our first full season eleven. I think it's season eleven. Season eleven trailer. Um, Jody Whittaker actually showed up at the panel. It was the whole team. Um, everything is new. So that was kind of cool to see like new showrunner, new cast, new composer, did everything. All, all of it is new now. And that, Oh, go ahead. But, but Billy's still in it, right? Who? Wait, is that her name? Billy the, Piper? Um, no, the, uh, who's the, uh, the companion of the last doctor. Oh, Bill. No, uh, Rose Mackey. She, no, no, she was just in that one season and then that's it. This oh, is all a total reset. Oh, okay. No, no, no. Hard, hard reset. Everything is new. The TARDIS interior is going to be new. Um, it's really, it was really interesting because this is the first time they have rolled out a new doctor and new season with, with such coordination so much so that the new Sonic screwdriver was debuted on the panel. Like you saw it in the trailer, she held it up and then they're like, and you can buy it on the floor now. So you can literally <laughs> go and buy the new Sonic screwdriver, which looks amazing by the way. It's it, completely new design, totally alien looking. There's going to be a lot of a lot of vibrator jokes, I'm sure, unfortunately, but it is just is what it is. I mean, uh, I love their toothbrushes, so I assume exactly. their screwdrivers are great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Jody was uh, just unbelievably charming and wonderful, and like the trailer was exciting, and I can't wait. So, it just if you are a Doctor Who fan, that was like it, it was well worth the wait. Um, and what was really cool too, they didn't give you a lot of a lot of sort of clues as to what the season's going to be. It was really cryptic. You know, they showed you a lot of little scenes and stuff, but they're playing a lot of this close to the vest, which I really appreciate. Um, it's the first time Dr. Who's ever had a writer's room. So, you know, traditionally in British TV, there's like what we consider the okay. showrunners, like the uh, head writer. And then they just, you know, they, they themselves by themselves might plan out a season. And then they just find independent contractors essentially to write all the episodes, but there's not a room that people get in and they, you know, they, for two weeks, they sort of blue sky the season and, yeah. and figure it out and whiteboard it. This is the first time that Dr. Who's ever had that. So it's going to be really cool to see what that turn, you know, what we get out of the stories, how the episodes fit together. Um, and the fact that they're being deliberately sort of mysterious about it gives me really high hopes. So, so can't wait. one thing remind uh, those of us who have not watched it, where have we seen Jodie Whittaker before? She was uh, one of the main actor actresses in Broadchurch. She was Danny Latimer's mom that, uh, you know, spoilers, the first season of Broadchurch, Danny Latimer dies. And the whole first season is about who <laughs> killed. It's that not a spoiler. like an unnecessary spoiler. No, but that's the first episode of season one, right? So the whole season is like oh, who okay. killed Danny Latimer. Like that's the whole point of the season. And then the second <laughs> season is also basically about that. Well, she's Danny's mom. 
that's where I first saw her. She's been in a Black Mirror episode. She's been in some other stuff too. So she's pretty accomplished as an actress already. A um, lot of good drama uh, as well, but I can't wait to see her do comedy. And she just looks, she just looks the part. She's so perfect. I, I was sure. Well, okay, this is I, maybe I've just mixed her up with someone else, but I thought she had been in something way more uh, like an American production that we would have seen. Oh, she's maybe Attack the Block. Wow. Oh, I haven't seen that. I, I, I haven't seen that either, but I hear heard really, really good things about it. Um, okay. Uh, do you, so when does the new season officially start? This fall sometime, uh, probably okay. September, late September, October. And how do you watch them? Uh, I watched them b- previously in the last couple of years and probably with this one too. Um, it will come out like Saturday night. And then so Sunday morning, it'll be available on Amazon to just buy or iTunes to buy for like two or three bucks. So I just do that. Um, gotcha. Then later on, I think Amazon has the rights to Doctor Who now, so or the exclusive rights to it in the in the states for streaming. So once the season's over, they'll all be all ten seasons are on Amazon Prime now. Um, my guess is once this is all over, they'll just put it up there too. But if you want to watch it the next day, um, just buy it on iTunes or Amazon. What I'm you, sure. Where would you recommend someone start watching? Like just the last season or the last two seasons, like to kind of get ready for this. Because this is totally a, a total reset, I think you could start just watching her oh. with the season. It's going to be cool because they're going to have three companions now, and one of them's an older gentleman, and then like there's two younger people, and so it's it's a really diverse cast, which is really cool to see. But there, you know, when a new doctor comes in, it's always a great time to start watching the show because you'll see everything through their eyes, and that will kind of be your entry point in. Um, I still think Capaldi's the best one they'll ever have. So if you want to, you know, if you want to see some a master class in acting on a weekly basis, go back and watch those Capaldi episodes, especially the most recent one with Pearl Mackey as the companion. That's that it, it's going to be really hard to beat that, but I think I think she might cuz she's going to be fun. she her her acting chops I think are up to par and she's going to have that really fun loving sort of whimsical vibe to her too. But yeah, if you haven't seen the show yet, you want to jump in, this great place to start. I also one note about that and then we'll move on. Uh, BBC America does show the episodes on Saturday night, but BBC America has commercials. Do not watch Doctor <laughs> Who with commercials. It's the most infuriating thing in the entire world. Um, yeah, it's it, it ruins the tempo, ruins the flow. It it the commercials usually spoil something coming up. So it's just like it. Don't do it. Stay away from BBC America. Download them so you can watch them commercial free. You'll be so much happier for it. Cool. Um, have, not, oh, go ahead. One more thing on our good list. I think that's what you were about to transition into. Anyway. Yeah. So Castle Rock, real, just a real quick, Castle Rock is a new TV series. Um, Mark Bernardin of Fat Man and Batman is actually a writer on it. That's how I learned about it. But they had um, their, their coming out party at, at SDCC. And I was told there was a lot of like uh, Castle Rock uh, live event kinds of stuff. They actually built a replica town somewhere. Um, did you see any of that stuff? Because I heard it was really cool. Like it was off site. You know, so we had talked about, you know, there's stuff happening in and around the convention center. And this was like one of those installations, I guess. Yeah. So right in front of uh, like a public fountain sort of pool thing, they had part of this, um, which was like a car crashed into the pool um, and then just a man wandering out in the middle of the <laughs> in the middle of the pool. It was mm-hmm. uh, but that's all I saw. I mean, it's possible that I walked right past this this fake town and it was um it just didn't stick out to me because there's sort of a, a route that you walk through there where you're on the back side of everything. There was a Walking mm-hmm. Dead thing and there was a Mission Impossible uh, helicopter up on a building and like some sort of experience there. So that's really all I saw. Um, it didn't feel like a huge presence like there, you know, mm-hmm. but I also think there they had that. Um, it, it's all about like timing, I think, at mm-hmm. Comic-Con, too. It's like they're premiere happens the next week right yeah I mean, yeah so i think kind of like the promotion they were doing was really just about like hey watch watch this next week it wasn't you know they weren't trying to do a big huge introduction to it like something like aquaman or shazam or something well they did a panel they did like i think yeah, a yeah, whole yeah, course, panel yeah. or something to that extent and it's on hulu too let's remind folks about that this is hulu taking their handmade tail money and trying to expand their reach a little bit so it'll be cool to see See how, and I, if you haven't seen Handmaid's Tale, holy crap, what are you waiting for? Um, that I haven't seen that either. Truly one of Hulu's, like that was one of the best creative decisions they've ever made was, was uh, both getting that, the rights to that show and making it as 
it, here's the thing about Handmaid's Tale. Like I always thought it was more of just like a dystopian drama, which it is, but it's weird as hell. Like they they really have fun with their music cues. A lot of it's like a stage play. Um, it's just like a lot of the moments are really surreal. So it's not like a docudrama so much as just like this weird sort of surrealist dystopian thing that's I it, it sort of sucks you in. It's got it's definitely got its own aesthetic that it's completely its own thing. Um, so anyway, if you've been looking for that, let's transition though, the good, yeah. uh, to the bad and, um, not a lot of bad, but a few things worth mentioning. One of my big questions for you, I was reading this year more than any other, a lot of problems with hall H and I if you don't, if you don't know, hall H is, Oh, yeah, go yeah. Ahead. Go ahead. Well, hall H is, if you don't know is where all the big panels happen. And what I've read was, was basically like a lot of lines, like there'd be these big lines and people wouldn't let anybody in, but then there was all these empty seats in hall H that they, people could have had things were miscommunicated. It just, it was logistically just really bad this year. Did hmm. you notice any of that? No. Huh? <laughs> Um, there's a, a funny thing too. Like I didn't, I was unaware of the hall H impact completely this year. Mm. Um, and I don't know if it was, if they had like structured it in a way so that the, you know, maybe the next day's line was hidden from view from mm. me or something like that. But mm -hmm. yeah, I didn't, I didn't notice anything and I didn't hear anyone there, uh, commenting about it. So interesting. It may maybe the maybe just there was a, a few specific examples that just yeah, I'm curious because I, you know that is a that is a thing. Like um uh what was I gonna say? Like that that whole thing about the empty seats is a big deal where it's like if you you know you wait in this line and then you walk into this half empty theater, it's like very frustrating. Why yeah. do I wait in this line? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um another interesting sort of less than stellar uh happening was um sony was there and sony had a couple of debuts but apparently anyone who who saw the sony presentations or panels left really really underwhelmed and it was unfortunate because sony marvel wasn't there this year and you know rightfully so post infinity war like there's not really much they can talk about or show so it was made sense that they weren't there but them not being there left a big huge vacuum for dc to fill which i think dc for the most part did fairly well sony could have stepped up too and they didn't really do anything they didn't it's like they didn't even care um, well they did know, the uh I, what was their big uh like tent pole was it venom venom i think venom and okay. then i think they they hinted at spider-man homecoming 2 um like or whatever that whatever the title is they gave yeah, a few yeah, yeah, right. details but not anything nothing much nothing i mean just it all kind of seemed like a big a big nothing as far as sony was concerned and it's like you guys like sony this is what here's a perfect opportunity for you to, to step up and fill that Marvel void. And they just didn't seem to care. So yeah, I, know. I, I wonder if the, the wind is really taken out of Sony's superhero tales. I did see some of the coverage of venom and um, uh, what's his name? Bane, whoever <laughs> Tom Hardy, uh, Tom Hardy. Um, and it was just, uh, like, uh, I, I don't, I just felt him, uh, in the quotes I saw, like really trying to convince us that this was going to be interesting, <laughs> which yeah. was like, I honestly, I, I waited so long to watch that Venom trailer. I may have already said this on a podcast. I was so uninterested in Venom as a character, as a movie. I just thought this is such a dumb idea for this. And then Jenny Slate is right there in the trailer. And I was like, well, I guess I'm seeing that. <laughs> oh, interesting. I didn't realize Jenny Slate was in it. What is she? She's like the scientist that connects with him and studies this. Interesting. And interesting. Yeah. Also, uh, uh, um, uh, not like the polar opposite of her Parks and Rec character, Mona Lisa Saperstein. Oh, I forgot she was, she cameos in Parks and Rec. He, it's funny you mentioned this is, this shows how, um, how indie I am. You said Bane. As soon as you said Bane, I was thinking Ricky Tar, which is who Tom Hardy plays in Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Because oh, I've yeah. seen that so many times. I'm like, oh yeah, he's Ricky Tar. There he is, Ricky Tar. You know, so um, I think of him as his character from Peaky Blinders. He's in Peaky Blinders. Yep. <laughs> I have not watched enough of that show. Apparently, I know Chris. Uh, it's, uh, Kieran. Um, what's his yeah. face? Isn't it? Um, yep. Your uh, crow. Not, not Hines. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, no, not Kieran. Hines. Although Kieran Hines would in anything is worth seeing. I mean, even freaking yeah. Steppenwolf is worth seeing just for Kieran Hines. Um, you no, know, so Sony just didn't do 
no do much which is too bad and it's their own their own fault uh another interesting sort of uh i don't even know how this is really bad so much as unfortunate um the fantastic beast 2 panel happened this year and that trailer looks pretty good i wish they had just called it you know like dumbledore the movie because like I, all i want to see is jude law you know i don't <laughs> care so much about the other characters as much as you know young dumbledore but they had johnny depp so johnny depp as we all know is is grindelwald um which is unfortunate because colin farrell was so great at the before shot of that so johnny depp they bring him to comic-con they dress him up as grindelwald like remember how when uh, tom hiddleston was loki a couple years ago and came out in character and it was like the toast of comic-con um Johnny, they, I think they were kind of wanting that for Johnny Depp. So he comes out uh, as Grindelwald. He got booed uh, quite a bit. <laughs> and I, I don't know if he knew that that was for him or for the character. <laughs> he was a villain. So he's like, this just must be you hate Grindelwald. It's like, no, we hate you. Uh, and then right before, or sorry, right after that, out comes Amber Heard, his former wife, as part of the Aquaman panel. Oh, so it's like, who scheduled these to be back to back? And, and, you know, I didn't hear about anything else that went on. I'm sure they avoided each other like the plague, but it just kind of seemed like bad taste to have Johnny Depp out, you know, mugging around as Grindelwald. And then like his former wife, uh, you know, from which a lot of his negative press and, you know, you know, she, there's a lot to be said for the fact that she probably suffered some abuse from Johnny Depp. And then all of a sudden she comes out too in her own movie. So I, it just seemed like really, yeah bad taste on comic-con's part for you know nobody stepped in to say let's not let's separate these or you know something else yeah um, that is that is like a surprising uh, uh juxtaposition that they would make there i mean i'm sure that it was hall h so i'm sure it was like large enough that they could enter and exit hopefully through totally separate areas but yeah um, i it was interesting because the i want to say that most of that cast was at was in the exhibition hall doing a signing Mm -hmm. um before or after that panel mm -hmm. but not johnny depp and mm -hmm. now that you because i didn't really i mean i knew he came out in full uh costume makeup but i didn't know that he was booed mm -hmm. and i wonder if that's why he stayed off the floor of the mm -hmm. exhibition hall because that's where they have to like really like ramp up security and sort of carve their own little like walking path you know they like block oh off yeah all this traffic and have to hustle people to a table um and you know like and usually for that one it's like behind like they're going into like sort of a little room and then coming out at a table so they can do their autographs and stuff but jude law was there and eddie redbane and um like as far as i know like the rest of the cast um just not johnny depp yeah i'm gonna guess i'm gonna guess it's twofold it's probably that he was in makeup and costume and you know that just takes a while and that to get too. Out of. yeah that's that's a, that's always a issue. and also probably just like i mean he's even though he's you know thought of less than favorably these days he still creates a giant screaming mob wherever he goes you know so my guess is there was a little True. of that too even more so than jude law like jude law is a great guy but jude law is still you know he doesn't create a spectacle where he goes you know people no. like, oh it's jude law it's not like oh my god it's the beatles you know it's not he you know he also doesn't you know he, he <laughs> sounds weird he looks normal enough that like jude law could kind of yeah. sneak in behind you and you wouldn't know it but that's true yeah he's not wearing a fedora uh, johnny, with 25 necklaces right. and like you know <laughs> like i always picture johnny depp walking around as jack sparrow yeah. <laughs> so yeah. yeah um and i not to uh, uh not to use this as an awkward segue but boy i'll tell you one thing i don't like about the aquaman trailer is that aerial colored hair on amber Heard. <laughs> that is weird isn't it it's like so little mermaid and if they're doing that on purpose if that's kind of a nod to that then maybe i'm down with it but otherwise it's just so it's like so striking like this is you know such here's a, a redhead though in the yeah. comics though too it's not like it's out of the ordinary yeah, i know that's true very true I, I i put it aside i did you see i made a quick note in our our notes here about that i i don't know that the the um uh, Jakuku Pahuinas, uh Joker news came out of Comic Con, but I think Jakuku Pahu oh, 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 pronunciation of Joaquin Phoenix, right? Okay, um, just look for that on YouTube. Uh, but he, uh, um, but that that news came out at Comic Con, I believe, or at least like the day before. Like, the I think Wednesday, you're right, maybe. Yeah. So I, I don't know how official to take this, or the news that there are now two Joker movies in development, and I think all of it is stupid. I don't want to see either of these people as Joker. 
Does anybody honestly believe that the Jared Leto Joker movie is going to be made? I so don't. Is, is that where we are? We just, okay. I, no, no, no. That's kind of how I was feeling. Like, I thought, like, I don't really think that one's getting made. The only reason that was even sort of hinted at, in my opinion, is that, like, his agent was like, well, he's the Joker, too, so we're going right, to circulate right. a rumor that he's the, the movie. I mean, but, like, at this juncture, I mean, it's got the writings on the wall. Like, come on, dude. Like, yeah, you're not... I wonder if he will appear in that. Is it, Are they now calling it Birds of Prey, the new Harley Quinn movie? I think movie? so. I think yeah, so. Yeah. Um, which is interesting, too, because I think it was tossed out at one point to call it Gotham City Sirens and have it be about, like, Catwoman, Harley, and Ivy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now it's going to focus. Well, just that title makes it focus more on like Huntress and uh, Batgirl. And I, I don't know the Batgirl's in it, but I, Black Canary and Huntress are definitely in it. I think until I see a trailer, I don't, I'm not believing any of that. Exists. Okay. Gotcha. Like, yeah. Okay. No, that's good. I'm, I'm on board with that. <laughs> Cause who sure. knows? Cause at one point wasn't, um, wasn't uh, uh, Josh Dross Whedon associated with that. And then he got moved off and it's just like, yeah. It just there's so, so much turmoil. Here's a question though. Joaquin Phoenix as the Joker, what are your thoughts? Is that a I think inspired it's casting? You no, think? I don't I mean I'm sure like he you know I I'm sure he will be like give a good performance in it. But between the master and um uh what am I thinking of where he's that just super evil dude and uh um but this year's uh Oh shit! He was just in this movie this year where he's like walking around with a hammer, striking vengeance on uh no. child uh, traffickers. Um, but between those, like all these roles, it's like he's already been the Joker. Mm. And maybe this, if this had been ten years ago or something, it would be interesting. But I just could not care. He's. F this is going to be a weird note, but he's forty three currently. If this is an origin story, I kind of feel like the person who's playing the Joker should be a little younger. You know, like this, I would oh, imagine, yeah, totally. Yeah. I would imagine this is something that would happen to him in his like early twenties. Not when he's like, you know, middle age, like that is, that seems a little odd and maybe they'll find some way if there's ever an actor who can pull off, you know, this is going to be him. I, in my heart of hearts though, I still think Adrian Brody would be the best Joker if they could <laughs> just figure out how to get him. Like, it's never going to happen now, but it's like that they had a really good opportunity um, I don't know if he was even interested, but I just, I, I watch him in a lot of things. I'm like, man, he would be a fantastic Joker. He'd be a he great Riddler. Part. Adrian Brody is the Riddler. That would be interesting too. Um, I, I think the problem with Joker too is like, so Jared Leto, like I, I didn't, you know, oh boy, did he annoy me in that Suicide Squad mo movie. But I do think he fit the aesthetic of the Suicide Squad movie. Yeah. And I don't see Joaquin doing anything, but almost feeling like, the continuation of the Heath Ledger Joker. And that is, that is just so hard. It's like Heath Ledger just embodied that part. Yeah. And it's going to be really tricky to, to have oh, Joaquin, do that. a very similar schooled actor do it is, oh, man. You know, but here's, here's an even better question. Do we need a Joker origin movie? Because no. to me, an origin movie humanizes the villain. Yeah. And this is not somebody like, <sighs> This is going to be a tricky to navigate because I, as we all know, loved the White Knight comic series. And the White Knight humanized the goddamn Joker. But it did it after the fact, right? Oh. He was already the Joker. He, through all these circumstances, becomes normal Jack Napier. And the whole thing subverts you know, the Joker and Batman's relationship. So then Batman's the villain and Jack Napier's the hero. That worked for me. Because it was never like like it, we don't get to see how the Joker came to be. It doesn't matter. Like the point here is that he has this sort of chance to be a regular person. What does he do? It's almost like the uh, the White Knight was almost like the movie Awakenings. And follow me on this because this is gonna be weird. <laughs> so Robert De Niro just it, you know he they don't spend a lot of time on like Robert De Niro before he had this condition in Awakenings where he was basically not brain dead, but he couldn't really interact a lot. You know, he was he, he shut off from the world. And we, all we know is that, oh, this happened to him when he was a kid. So like his mental state is still like his, his awareness of the world is still that of, of a child. But we don't need to see like, you know, the Awakenings prequel where that happens. Awakenings is, is it meaningful because he's in this state and he has a, you know, he has a, a period of time where he's, he's not. And like it, the heartbreak of that movie is he's got to go back to being this thing. I kind of look at white Knight the same way. It's like, here's the Joker's chance. Here's what he would be like if he didn't have this problem of being the Joker. I've got so a, did, a, a head fuck of a question for you. Okay. What if they made white Knight a movie with Jared Leto? 
do you think he can pull that off? Would it be Jared Leto's Joker as it appears in Suicide Squad or a totally new iteration? Well, you know. I, I don't think would... I don't think Jared Leto's Jared Leto's Suicide Squad Joker works in the White Knight. Okay. He's too much because he's too much of a gangster. That's my Good problem point. with like him and the like he's not it's almost like a, a random gangster who just happens to dress up in Joker makeup. It's that, not the I, Joker. I know. You know? No, you're that you nailed what I hate about that Joker because that's like, it's always sort of disconcerting in the comics when Harley is so attached to Joker. Cause mm -hmm. you're like, you're, you know, you are a psychiatrist. What's wrong with you? How can, you yeah. know, how, how did this take hold in you? But that's a Joker who's, you know, um, kind of dressed up and he sort of has this flair for things and stuff. And in the movie, it's like, Oh man, it just makes even less sense. Like this, yeah. you're right. It's like a, it's like a, just a, Run of the mill, like really cruel gangster, wearing a bunch of makeup. You know, and the thing, the thing that makes Heath Ledger's Joker truly work for me is that there's no origin story. He just manifests. It's like once Batman appears, he and, and it's it's perfect because at the end of Batman Begins, they you know Jim Gordon pulls yeah. out that card and goes, "We're gonna have to look into this." And it's almost like because Batman exists, the Joker just manifests, and he yeah. is, and he's a constant. Like they played that so well. I have my problems with the Dark Knight, believe it or not, but like the way the Joker's handled is not one of them because they play it as the perfect opposite of Batman, which is what it should yeah. be. We don't need to know, like the. We don't need to know how that guy got to be that guy. Like that doesn't no. matter, and it's like I don't. And so to humanize, like, is the Joker going to be like a vigilante at the end, like? Because they're going to be this like, oh, he's a, you know, he's a thousand shades of gray. It's like, no, yeah, yeah. we don't, we don't need that. So I don't. That, I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that and uh white Knight are the only two portrayals of the Joker that I, really work for me because same. he's so anonymous in dark Knight. It's terrifying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, like, and that thing of where he's like tells three different stories about how he got like the, the scars on his face. Yeah. And you're like, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Like well, it, that's important. Path, you know, that's important though because, like, and that that drives the point home even more, yeah. right? Because it's not like there's one story. It's like no. it doesn't matter to him. Like he, where he came from matters so little to him. Yeah, that he's yeah. going to make up a different story every time just to fuck with people. Yeah, and it's yeah. like we don't need to see a movie of Joaquin Phoenix as like a you know a failed comedian, and it's like I'm gonna it, no, it doesn't matter. So as much as I love Joaquin Phoenix, it's just this is this seems like a bad idea from from the get go. I. I joked with you earlier. I was like, there's a, there's a dark dimension somewhere where instead of making the killing joke animated movie, which came out last year, right. That you saw that at when then they was, did. I think it was two years ago, actually. It was terrible regardless. Like yeah. you were there for the debut at, at, at Comic-Con and it's just not good. There's some dark reality where they made the killing joke, a Broadway play a la <laughs> that Harry Potter, you know, how they took the Harry Potter play. It's, I mean, it's like a West end Broadway play. They took the killing joke and made it a Broadway play with Adrian Brody as the Joker, and it works so much better. Like that's in my my mind palace. Like that that's a real thing. I don't know. Um, it could have been the Spider-Man Broadway play where everybody gets hurt on it. Well, that's what you get. So, with. speaking of terrible ideas in the Batman family, <laughs> yeah, let's get. I think let's we should hit the, the ugly. We only really yeah. had like one thing to note in the ugly. There's one ugly from Comic Con. And it is the Titans TV trailer. Let's let's start from the beginning. The Titans TV show is meant to be DC's first flagship show on their streaming network. All right. So already the bar is set pretty high. I have yet to see a trailer for anything be this divisive. It's like they purposely <laughs> constructed it to piss off every single nerd, fan, geeky person, casual person that they could possibly find. And some of it's warranted and some of it's not. But regardless, it's just the whole thing. After the fun of the Shazam trailer and the grandeur and sort of, you know, uh, you know, like Shakespearean nature of the Aquaman trailer, we get this like just doubling down of the grim, dark DC universe. And, and it's capped off with Robin literally saying in the trailer, fuck Batman. Like it's, it's, it's like they couldn't even like, even though he says it in the show, you don't have to put it in the trailer unless you're just so desperate for people to, to think that you're, you know, like this is going to be like, you know, not your father's teen Titans. And it's, it's really funny for me because at the same time, this is coming out. We have teen Titans go the most yeah, I was fun, 
silly, harmless you know, cartoon of all time, and like the, probably the most kid-friendly interpretation of Teen Titans, juxtaposed along this just gritty, dark, blah, you know. I oh god, I don't. That's I don't, uh. I you no you had told me uh, when we talked before recording um, you were like don't watch it I'll just describe it to you but I did watch most of it uh -oh. and the thing that struck me well first of all I'm so glad you brought up the Teen Titans Go movie because that is getting like great reviews yeah and to have that come out the same week as this stupid trailer is mind boggling like why would you do yeah. that yeah um and then but anyway I when I watched the Titans trailer. Uh, so my volume was really low and I was just kind of watching the visuals. It looked so much to me like a bunch of uh, fan films on YouTube. Yes, right? And there are a bunch of Nightwing fan films and stuff that I think are really good. Mm -hmm. And then to see this like where it's shot in the dark a lot and it's, you know, sort of meant to hide the crappy special effects or the set or whatever was just ugh, like what a letdown. Yeah, um, yeah. No cyborg. Let's just put that put out that out there. It's like it's it. it and a lot of people, DC has this problem where, for years in the '90s and early aughts, they put out these amazing animated series, like the Justice League animated series and Justice League Unlimited are huge examples of that. Yeah. Teen Titans, the animated series, built huge fan bases. People still love those properties. That is how, honestly, a lot of people, including myself, got introduced to a lot of these characters was through those animated series. So. Of course, DC not it's it's like they could have taken what was great about that Teen Titan original Teen Titans animated series and just replicate that as a TV as a live action show. But no cyborg. The way they portray Raven looks like she's some character from The Ring, which is just like really mm, confusing. Yeah. Starfire is dressed like a streetwalker, and I don't. There's no explanation for that yet. I'm, maybe there's some logic in the show as to why that is. But don't put that in a trailer because that's just going to confuse people even more. And just yeah. and of course, Robin just being so hard ass like. Well, I had, and oh, and isn't it like like to me, it seems like. Um, well, I get I mean, we, we you know, we can just say this to address it is that complicating all this is that it just it doesn't look good. But no. then complicating it is that. Uh, there's there have been a lot of like racist attacks on the yeah. Starfire actress. Oh yeah, people upset that this orange alien um, <laughs> is now portrayed by a black woman, and it's like yeah. Yeah. that's such a, a non controversy. I don't know why you know, like I don't know how you defend that position except by being a racist. Well, but, let me let me let me massage that just briefly because I well, I did talk to somebody who said that, and when I got to the bottom of it with them, they said it, it was clear it was more about how she was costumed and less about the race. I'm not saying that's everybody, but I think the way right, right, right. it was a one, two punch of if, if she was in the traditional star and I'm not even saying like the skimpy, you know, like, you know, barely bra costume from the comics. I'm talking about like what she looked like in the animated series. If she looked like that, I think a, I, I'm not, I don't know how many, but I think less people would have been so put off by it. But the fact that it was, it was a weird costume and she was of color, I think just freaked everybody, you know, freaked all those people out. And it's, it was unfortunate. It sort of reminds me of like when we talked about Iron Fist last year, I think this is when that came up, where we were saying, yes, there are problems with like the whitewashing of Asian characters or whatever. But the but the problem is really that like it's just so bad yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that it's like we don't even need to engage yeah. on those yeah. attacks because uh, so anyway, my my question here about the Titans is like it would have made so much more sense to me if they set this in the Gotham TV series look and universe. Yeah, you're right. You know, yeah. where it's like, okay, now let's have Gotham tell the story of young Bruce, but let's also have Titans tell the story of young Dick, mm -hmm. you know? And, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, that would have made more sense to me, but like showing it, uh, you know, I kind of know the era of teen Titans that they are, they're probably launching at Cause he's still Robin, you know, like you had pointed out to me, he's pro probably the season story is going to be him changing into Nightwing. And yeah, um, I, I think you're totally right, because he's right that age when they did, you know, when uh, uh, Wolfman and Lopez did that in the comics. Um, but it's I, it's just a weird age. It's like, I don't get it. I, like, it's 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 clearly not as charming as like Flash or Supergirl. Um, it's not as grown up as Arrow. And it's it also doesn't have the aesthetics of Gotham. So like, where, where does this fall in the DC TV universe? I just don't. Yeah. Notice too, they're not calling it teen Titans. They're calling it Titans. Yeah. So it's and like, I, you know, they're trying I to say that's really trying to make it. 
I think that's a change they made in the comics, though. Oh, okay. I think, I think the lit last reboot of that is now just called Titans. I'm not totally sure. But does this is this if you were DC, are you were launching your your streaming service on this? Like, I, I just don't. It's so dumb. Like, why? You know, I'll, I'll go out on a limb and say this. I what they should have done, especially after seeing the trailer, they should have made Shazam a ten episode series with oh the same God. cast and everything, exactly like they're making it. Just make it a ten episode series. It would have been the biggest thing on streaming for a year. You know, D don't do this. Make Shazam your series with everybody in it, just like it is. Make it and and make it so that you can cross it over with the movies if you wanted to. Don't section it off in its own sort of phantom zone like you have the, the the cw shows make it its own thing but then like you know have gal gadot show up on an episode like they could have just i would have signed up immediately i'm like i don't care what else they have on here i want to watch this and just see where it goes but they just That's don't interesting idea. Not thinking yeah not thinking it, just, it just does not look appealing to me um, anyway yeah anyway. You, would, you would ask uh, if there's anything else that i saw and experience this was kind of a low-key comic-con for me i pretty much did everything that I intended to do that I told you about. I went to um, uh, uh, Victoria V.E. Schwab's, uh, her panel, which was about her adapting. She doesn't, she's not adapting her Shades of Magic novels to a comic. She is just writing a comic that fills in the story. And it was really cool to hear her talk about that because it's exactly what you and I have talked about on so many other things, you know, and especially like um, uh, the Stephen King universe, you know, and sort of having that extended universe. Mm -hmm. uh, now that I can't remember the name of the cowboy movie with Idris Elba in it, uh, and Matthew McConaughey. Oh God, Dark Tower, <laughs> yeah. Dark Tower series. So yeah, what Victoria is doing is like, there's a comic book coming out called Shades of Magic, that is about the world of her trilogy, sort of just surrounding it. So it just sort of you know gives you more color to it. It doesn't. Um, it's not like George Martin trying to write an endless history of this stuff. That's like where mm -hmm. everything's going to connect, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and, but it's also, um, you know, you don't, it, it's kind of like you read the novels and you might get interested in reading comics, you read the comics, you might get interested in the novels, but they can stand alone. Um, anyway, that was a really interesting panel because it was just her being interviewed about that process, which was very cool. Uh, I went to the fake geek curl fallacy uh, panel, which was really great. It was uh, uh, Preeti uh, uh, Cheber, who I'd mentioned on the podcast, was on that, and um, several other uh, women who are all authors. Um, one of the writers, Luke Cage, was there. I'm sorry that I'm not remembering these names. Um, they were all like, they all had such cool things to say about, you know, uh, being authors and also being women in a geek space. And uh, that was just a really good panel to see. And I saw uh, Sam Maggs, the author. Um, that I'd mentioned and got her new book and got her to sign that. And uh, I met uh, the artist of Lumberjanes, which is a book that I will surely talk about later. Um, and I'm trying to think uh, what I'm leaving out here. Um, but also just had a couple of like really good conversations with other artists and stuff. And um, went through the game rooms again and kind of explored the game stuff there and uh, went to the Drawn and Quarterly booth. And while I did not purchase anything because their books are very heavy and hard to carry around at a Comic-Con. Um, I, I had this conversation with a, uh, another customer there who was, we were just going off on like the different drawn and quarterly titles that we really like. And uh, so I got a ton of good recs from him on stuff to read next. And definitely nice. that new Guy Delisle book hostage uh, sounds incredible. Wait, so, Guy, wait, 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 Guy Delisle did a graphic novel. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, like the Pyongyang person. Oh, who am I thinking of? I'm thinking of, uh, hang on. Who? Uh, Jesus Christ. Who am I but thinking of? Um, th this one is not about him. It's a, it's an actual like true story about this hostage. Uh, so it is, it is, uh, you know, a true story again, but it's not one of his autobiographical. Uh, oh, I, I, yet. my, my apologies to Guy Delisle. I, for some reason in my head thought it was, was seeing Gay Talese when oh, you yeah, said yeah. that, who is, <laughs> Also an author, but not at all the same same guy. So forgive me, Guy Delisle. Like, yeah, I love Pyongyang. I forget which episode that is, but I I reviewed it in one of our past eps. Yeah, that's and, one of uh, our really early uh, coffee and comics eps. Um, you keep talking, I'll find it. Um, <laughs> uh, shoot, 
That's okay. I've got a, I have a, a hit list of books that we'll be talking about in upcoming episodes. Um, I'll just tease a few. I don't know which one I'm going to do next week just yet, but I think I'm going to choose between uh, Citizen Jack, which we've been talking about, or I've been talking about for a little while. Um, Injection, uh, volume three has come out. So I really want to talk about Injection. I think that is uh, in my long list of image comics or image series that should immediately be TV series, that's definitely on that list. And um, there's another non-image book that is amazing called Arcadia. And I'm thinking that was a boom title. It was a boom title? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. it was a boom title. I can um, picture it. I don't know what the... It has some of the best covers of all time. That's when I got into it, but it's actually super cool. I, I may just do Arcadia, uh, but it's going to be one of those three next week. So cool. look forward to that. I've got a ton of stuff on my reading shelf. Like it is ridiculous. Um, the, and several single issues that I'm following of like new series, like the new Thor and the new Catwoman. And um, Lainey, uh, my guest from a couple of episodes ago, uh, recommended I read this book called Unnatural. Um, if you see that in the comic book shop, you will know why I don't give a fuller description of it right now. Mm -hmm. um, they had some very uh, appropriately placed uh, stickers to inform people that it was not for minors. <laughs> mm -hmm. And of course I disclaimered it when I bought it and, and, and it told the, the person I was, you know, the, uh, the clerk checking me out. I was like, Lainey recommended this <laughs> all blame on her. Um, but, uh, but it may prove to be really interesting and I, and I may want to talk about that, but I've also got like, um, uh, a ton of, uh, novels back there, but I'm, I may end up doing that lumberjanes book because, I kind of um, want to hear more about that. I've, I've seen it. it. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen it. And I know you're, you're kind of into those. Uh, there's, there's a certain sort of subgenre of indie comics that you're into that I think this fits nicely. <laughs> and so I'd love to see, I'd love to see what that's about. Um, same for me too. I seem to have sort of a, I have, I, I was looking at my shelf the other day. I'm like, I kind of have a, I kind of have two sort of defaults I usually go to. And I, you know, I'm, I'm diversified too, but like there seems to be sort of two kind of categories of comics that I usually collect. So it's, uh, I need to ponder that a little further. Yeah. Um, by the way, too, I don't know if I mentioned it last time, but great work. Um, while I was out, uh, with some extra guests, if you haven't heard, um, Todd interview other people that aren't me go back. We actually have some of our episodes on YouTube now. So check oh, yeah. that out. Um, more to come. We're starting to load everything up there and on Facebook, but yeah, go check out those. Uh, I think it's episode 76 and 77. Um, yeah. Go check those out. Really great stuff. I actually really liked cool, listening you. as a listener. It was really fun. Uh, hopefully we'll get to do more of that soon too. Yeah, just like I liked listening to, to you host Mike Marlowe. Um, and Pyongyang is discussed in number 46. So you can go back to that to find out. Wow, number 46. Uh, cool. So where can people find this podcast? We are, uh, our website is findusthere.org. That's where you'll find all our shows. Coffee and Comics Club is available on iTunes. Well, Apple Podcasts. I need to stop saying iTunes. Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Pocket Cast, or wherever you find podcasts. And like I said earlier, soon to be more on YouTube and Facebook. So just Google Coffee and Comics Club on YouTube. And uh, I think our channel is there on YouTube. Um, yeah. More on that to come. Cool. See you next time. We'll see you next time. Bye.